Rajan, Sona, we're so grateful to have you uh, join us today. Again, thank you so much. Um, just to give a brief introduction, Ajahn Sona is the founder and abbot of Birkin Monastery. Born in Canada in 1954, Ajahn Sona's background was as a classical guitarist. His encounter with Buddhist wisdom as a young man initiated a spiritual journey that led him to become a lay hermit in the Coast Mountain region of British Columbia for several years. He subsequently ordained as a Theravada monk in 1989 under Bhante Gunaratna at the Bhavana Society in West Virginia, where his first years of training took place. Ajahn Sona further trained for another three plus years at monasteries in the Ajahn Chah tradition in Northeast Thailand, especially Wat Panana Chai. Upon his return to Canada in 1994, he helped found the original Birkin Forest Monastery near Pemberton, BC, and as its spiritual guide, served as its spiritual guide. Through several incarnations, he has since led Birkin Monastery, also known by its Pali name, Sitavana, translated as Cool Forest Grove through to its current and final resting place in a secluded, fully off-grid forest location just south of Kamloops, BC. So Ajahn, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much. Well, delighted to be with you guys. How, uh, how are you? How's the monastery? How are, how's life up there? Everything is quite lovely. Uh, of course, we're into the second year, almost a full two years of seclusion without guests because of the pandemic. Uh, but it has been a beautiful two years for us. Uh, it's everything. We have about 10 or 11 people usually in residence here in kind of continuous residence. And so uh, everything runs quite smoothly. Now uh, we stay fairly uh, isolated, but that's really not conducive for for monasteries. And uh, and we, of course, uh, this this very medium that we're using right now is the is our outreach. And we also have a very large upasaka organization. Uh, upasaka meaning uh, lay people who are interested in studying and com committing to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha and uh, studying the Dhamma particularly in gu with guidance from uh, from myself. And we have set this uh, up. So there's monthly assignments and studies and groups all over the place. And it is quite well organized because they're all over the world. And they have different time zones and so forth. So that that's ongoing as well. So we, we have a basic outreach to large numbers of people and of course our youtube um process is uh, happening as well yeah yeah i've uh i know several uh people in our community who are part of the upasaka program and it seems like one skillful means to address a situation i heard you refer to recently on a talk where people have one foot in the monastery and one foot on a banana peel which i thought yes. was a great way of putting it so right yeah, any, any well, advice for people in that situation, Ajahn? <laughs> well, there's so many. This is the, you know, this halfway situation is just very familiar. I've had so many people come through the, you know, thousands and thousands of people have come through the monastery over the la last, uh, what is it, 25 years I've been in the West. I, you know, right back to even before I was a Theravada monk, I was in a monastery in uh in Toronto, a Korean Zen monastery, and um, there's a whole generation of people who pass through these, and and this is the thing that's a little different than the time of the Buddha is that we have accommodation for lay people and stewards in the monastery, and they they come into the monastery for extended periods of time or go on retreats at monasteries or retreat centers, and this. That kind of situation wasn't the case at the time of the Buddha. And if you do, even if you spend a couple of weeks in a monastery or in a retreat, you come out the other side and you're not the same. <laughs> and the and there's question marks over your head after what have I done here? You know, like I have I've changed and I'm not quite sure how to handle these changes. And the world that I was taking for granted before is no longer being taken for granted. 
So I think a lot of people experience this and they don't know what to do about that. And I've been puzzling over it for a long time. I mean, decades, how do you set up some, how can you help uh, people who are sort of in the middle? So uh, again and again, I mean, people try to set up community, you know, lay communities and everything, but it's quite difficult. This is something you, you begin to appreciate about the Buddhas setting up the Sangha. You know, if you're going to do a spiritual community that's going to last, you're going to have to have really committed individuals who absolutely volunteer to take up this lifestyle and abandon their own private interests, because that's what it takes to form a continuous community. For lay people, they can visit or stay for periods of time as long as they conform to the, the, the atmosphere of a monastery. But if they, when they try to set up their own communes and so forth, like a spiritual commune sounds great. Ah, well, let's go off and you know, we'll have tiny houses and, and get some solar. And, uh, but the, the real trick is like, what are you going to agree on? What, what's your standard of behavior? Wh how often are you going to meet? Uh, what, is the, what are your obligations to this community? What, what's your relationship to your, the rest of your family or the outside world? This is, this is really almost unsolvable, this problem, as, as for lay, lay communities. So you see this uh, attempts through history to establish these communities. Uh, the U.S. has done that many times, the, the Quakers and the Shakers and the, and the Oneida communities and the on and on and on. And most of them don't never lasted. They lasted for a period of time, but they didn't. They didn't continue. There's a, there's a very hard to sustain even a any kind of committed spiritual community without that vinaya connection. You know the vinaya commitment. So so Ajahn, if you if people are in the situation where you know not necessarily set on setting up a separate community, but just like so many people in, you know, like you said, they come out of a contact with the Dhamma being changed and yet they can't find a way to align their lives with this new sense of purpose completely. What are, you know, three concrete steps you, you'd say that actually can like reduce that level of suffering or, or kind of nausea of, of feeling like you're not living what you need to be living you know and because I know a lot of people they you know there's that sort of idea of maybe I should be in the monastery or a monastic but that's not an option and there just seems to be no peace available for them um so how do they come closer to a sense of peace yeah they they need support and a sense of community and so these virtual monasteries that we're setting up are really uh, great situations. And they're, they get to know each other. There's just not that many people around the world at the moment that are lay people and really interested in uh, studying Dhamma and practicing. But there are people, but they're, they're sometimes hundreds of miles apart, etc. So we can connect them in cyberspace, you know. So we have this, we, we, they can go to meetings, they can all, they can choose to meditate at the same time, they can refer to the same teacher so that they're on, at the least they can communicate with each other. This is something we do with our Pasika program, I say, this is not, uh, you know, world philosophy uh, 101. This is not multi-religious studies, it's not even multi-Buddhist school studies, it's, it's a very uh, devotion to a particular tradition, but also primarily the, the teachings of the suttas, to become familiar with this, the core teachings, the Eightfold Path, types of meditation, etc., in the in this tradition, which is more or less Theravada or even pre-Theravada. It's the earliest school. I familiarize them with Theravada practices and commentaries and so forth, so they, they at least know about these things. And I give, sometimes I talk about differences from in, in schools of Buddhism within the, more or less the Theravada, but I want them to establish themselves in a classical training tradition. So they really know, understand what this is. And then if they wish to on their, 
as a hobby or on the side, they can investigate other philosophies, etc. But they should have a core that they are quite competent and knowledgeable about. And that takes a, at least to just to wet your beak takes a year. And then they go on to the next, there's about three years of more training. And, uh, and then they, of course they continue uh, and they can ask me questions and, and so forth. And we have uh, questions and answers and group meetings and email th- sort of things. So it's an ongoing education, but they, I don't, bring in a whole uh, fruit salad of different t- types of teaching. However delicious that fruit salad is, I basically stay with just this core early Sutta Theravada thing. And then they can talk to each other. And when they, when they actually have physical groups where they can actually go and sit with each other, they're on the same wavelength. They have the same etiquette. They have the same atmosphere. They don't bring controversy and disputes into that situation, which is the last thing they need. Because we're in a time of massive exposure to media and it's for what gets views is controversy and dispute. And that's, that's not what people need. And they're all complaining about this exhaustion from this conflict, conflict, etc. So this is the last thing they need. This is harmonious. It's focused. And we bring them in and we explain this carefully to them beforehand. There's no restriction on what they can do in their spare time or whatever they want, but just within these groups, these are the, the themes and the expected behavior and expected type of uh, speech that they, they should conduct themselves with. And it seems to be working quite well. We, they go, it goes one year at a time. So you join at the beginning of a year and then that's closed. Mm. So for, for the next full year, and you have to have gone through a, a full year of training in order to join the larger Upasaka group. So, uh, but people who are interested for the next year can certainly be aware that such a thing is available. Yeah. Uh, Ajahn, you, you talk about offering a, a traditional Theravada context, both in terms of when people actually, human people, go to your mm. monastery in Canada in person, and but also this context of um, the Upasaka program that you provide online. And I'm curious, um, like, I mean, a traditional Theravada context is like in a traditional Theravada country. And I'm curious, like what um, benefits you might find or what, um, what do you, do you feel about being online or being in the West makes presenting that, Theravada or pre-Theravada message uh, easier, and what about the the uh, your your setting, whether in the West or online, makes that that difficult? Well, we started uh, in in person because we thought thought the really important thing was to come to the monastery, and we and in order to sign up for this, I think the first group was thirty five people or something like that, or fifty people, something like that. Anyway, we found out there's, there's too many people to have in the monastery. <laughs> and we had, they all had to come at a certain time, three times a year. And they, they had, and we would show them all, you know, how do you walk into a sala? What, what is a Buddha image? What, how do you relate to a monk? And this is all in real time and discuss and meet each other and so forth. And then um, we, then we thought, now what? So we set up the, online kind of extension because we realized they can't come here all the time by the way i got this idea from the catholic idea of a third order oblate order the 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 uh benedictines and so forth have this lay third order where you're kind of a a monk out in the world or a nun out in the world but you you are committed to a specific monastery and a specific practice and you could be, and you every now and then your entire group gathers at that monastery. So that was the idea. I was looking for models, but as time went on, we realized, especially when the pandemic hit, that um, you know you can really set these things up without actually visiting the monastery. But we asked them, uh, "Have you visited any of the other any Theravada monasteries? Uh, there's our our branch monasteries all over the world, 
about any Theravada monasteries, etc., we, we ask a little questionnaire. And so then we do have videos of like entering a sala, how to sit, beginners uh, meditation instructions, how to relate to a monk, uh, how to, the gestures that are around in the traditional world, the bowing and the, uh, how, you, how would you offer some food or the various ceremonies and etc. So I introduce them to all of these things so that they have a full, it's kind of like, how do, it's like, a, I, you know, remember I'm actually trained in classical music tradition which is, uh, has a reservoir of very formal practices going back centuries. How, how do the conductor turns and bows to the audience and et cetera, and how, what kind of clothes do you wear and how do you hold your instruments and so forth. So this is, this is kind of beautiful. It, it, there's a tr whole tradition, a whole way of being in these monasteries. And so I wanted to show them that so that they could be comfortable if they went to monasteries uh, they wouldn't be alien. They wouldn't feel alien. Uh, but my real interest is in pre, pre monastic, sort of the pre cultural uh, Buddhism. Uh, and it, then we spend a lot of time in the suttas. Uh, it, so we, we understand, they understand where these customs and so forth come from, and that they are customs, and there is a certain cultural thing. We don't dismiss that cultural formalities. We educate them about them, but we don't say this is Theravada Buddhism. What we really say is that the essential teachings of the Buddha are found in the Pali Canon. Let's look at, that. Let's look at how they behave in there. So I want to give them a full uh, education about this. So they are comfortable. It's like going to a, a concert, you know, a, a opera in Italy or something like that, you know, how do, how do you behave? But it, uh, there's another aspect to it is like just studying the, the, the music itself, you know. So this is a kind of rounded education. The early pre, pre Theravada, I mean, Theravada is, a, is a, something that developed, it's, a, it's obviously the very early school, but there's, it's full of commentaries and cultural accretions. So what is the early teaching? And then what are these accretions? Are any of them useful? Um, uh, this is how it's done in certain different countries, etc. So this is like a whole, get interested in this because it's, it's value, it's, it will become a large part of your life. And uh, people, uh, every now and then they write to me that they were just in the hospital on the edge of death or something or somebody died and then and all this practice just came to them as they realize how important this was to their life, to getting through these situations. So this is, they may not realize it at the beginning, but this is going to permeate a lot of the meaning, meaningfulness of their lives. Jim, that's um, very helpful and um, speaks to the power of the tradition behind you know, you know what, what you're establishing. And mm. on a less traditional note, um, I'm curious about, you know, because there are certain points of friction between modern understandings and Buddhist understandings of, you know, the path towards um, well-being. And one that's come up recently in the West that I'm, I don't quite know how to interact with is that among psychedelic therapy. Mm. And, um, you know, I'm aware of the research from John Hopkins and NYU, and it seems pretty impressive. Um, at the same time, um, it, you know, in terms of quitting smoking, reducing fear of death, um, at the same time, it seems very clearly a breach of the fifth precept. And um, I also know that some elements of it have been lived through in the 60s already. So I'm curious how, what your thoughts on that whole realm are as a whole, how do we interact with it in a wholesome way as practitioners and as monastics? Yeah, I would say that if they decide that they're going to actually invest a considerable portion of their life in the practice, that they don't need psychedelics or all of these sort of other expedients, that you, you won't, you'll, you'll get a much better effect, but you'll have to work at it. 
And secondly, that what seem, may, may seem a very dramatic uh, effects from psychedelics are, are not as deep or long lasting or at your disposal as true continuous practice. So the psychedelic thing is that like, most people will not do an intensive course, an Upasaka course. They won't go to a monastery and spend hours and weeks and months meditating. So they're left with, uh, uh, you know, a kind of a terrible state of being that they're trying to address through psychedelics or just smoking a little bit of dope, you know, and just kind of get through it, you know. And these are two different levels of the game, and they shouldn't confuse them. One is, one is a kind of a, a medicine that just treats your symptoms and might make your life a little bit better. The other one is truly a deep and lifetime practice, which uh, utterly transforms you over, but over a period of time, sometimes decades, sometimes a whole lifetime. Um, and so they're not really comparable. And when people who, if you don't have a long-term spiritual practice and you have had a, some, a little breakthrough with LSD, you might say, oh yeah, but I got it quick, you know, but how do you know? <laughs> we, you will have, maybe you come to the monastery or spend some time in Northeast Thailand in a monastery doing all night sits and so forth. And you might find that your LSD thing is not as deep as you thought it was. Um, I remember a story about a, a monk who visited, I was at Wat Nana Chat, the International Forest Monastery in North, Northeast Thailand, where, where all of us have, have some roots. And it's a very austere and demanding place. It is, it would be illegal in, in, in any other, in the West. <laughs> so it's, it's an utter, utter commitment. And uh, so this, this monk uh, was practicing in Thailand and he, but he wasn't from Nana Chat. He showed up as sometimes visiting monks do. And you get some characters in the robes. And this, this fellow had been born in, uh, I think, Argentina, but of Dutch parents and so forth. And he was off roaming around the world. He said, I've been searching around the world and I was a hippie. I did everything. And, uh, and I, I, uh, I did a whole bunch of LSD and I thought I was enlightened. And I was living in this community. Now this is before he's a monk. So he's a, a seeker, a searcher, uh, you know, trying this and trying that, the, everything, the Sufi dancing and the this and the that and the drumming. And so he, he's, he had this revelation on, on his, on LSD and he said, you know, I'm enlightened. And then he was living in a commune, sort of a hippie commune. Finally, this guy shows up who is just rubs everybody the wrong way is just intolerable. And one day after a number of encounters, this is the monk telling me this story. He said, one day I, I grabbed him by the collar and I was about to, beat his head in and I realized I'm not enlightened. <laughs> and he, he let go of the, he let go of this guy and said, thank you very much. <laughs> the guy didn't know why he was saying it, but he said, the, what I was, I realized I'm not enlightened. <laughs> <clears throat> so then he found his way to the, through the robes. <clears throat> and, uh, uh, then you you start to see you know under all these circumstances a, a a moment of 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 breakthroughs is not enough it's what follows these things is it deep is it genuine you know i i had one question on um you know apophatic method where you articulate truth by what it's not um mm -hmm. and it seems like to me that the buddha was really an apophatic specialist with you know, you're not these khandas, but as to what the heart comes to when it releases all that, you know, he really was vague, uh, you know, labeling it nibbana, but certainly not going into the amount of detail that maybe other religions do in some sense. And I'm curious when language approaches a singularity like that, where you can't really talk about it anymore, 
um, is there room in the Buddhist conception for an idea similar or resonant with the Christian idea of God? And how would that play into, you know, an experience of stream entry, something like that? Um, it's a big question, but it's one I'm curious about. Well, <clears throat> the Buddha did say that wherever the Eightfold Path is found there, you will find people of each stage of enlightenment. And so if they're, they're apparent uh, engagement with God, depending on how they define it, is amounts to, excuse me, amounts to the, the experience of uh, insubstantiality or something like that, the, the dropping way of sense of self, if it fulfills the factors of the Eightfold Path, then they indeed may be some stage of enlightenment. They may be still utilizing language, theistic language, but they're what they mean by God is, you know, it's such an elastic term. And this is why a lot of atheists, you know, say basically, you know, you can't seem to define what it is you believe in, you know. I mean, there's there's the naive beliefs, the the big man in the sky, and 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 hardly anybody of any sophistication uh, in modern theistic religions, they don't use that, you know, that's not what they mean. So it's certainly obscure, though. The, the thing I would say that the, the problem of the God concept, of any kind of God concept, is that it just adds another unnecessary element to the situation. You're always thinking now, what would God say, or how do I relate to God and everything? And that tends, it just adds something that doesn't have to be there. And Buddhism takes that element away. It's such an intangible. So the, the, the theologians spend their lives trying to define characteristics and aspects of God and how you should interact. But it tends to be a, a distraction from what you actually have to do. So the Buddha is a very, he, he's using Occam's razor. You know, he's, he's using this, the simplest possible explanation. Whatever that is out there, it, you still have to do this, and you have to do it, not somebody else. By the way, there is a sutta, you know, where somebody who is a th theistic uh, view comes to the Buddha and says, you know, what about God? And uh, the Buddha says, well, you see these monks, you know, is the God that you're talking about, is he good? And they say, oh, yes, he's good. So these monks here, they're, they're very good too, aren't they? So there shouldn't be, there's no quarrel, seems to be no quarrel. God's good and they're good. What's the, what's the problem here? Uh, by the way, uh, Thoreau, near the end of his life, was, Thoreau was very in, influenced by Buddhism and uh, some, uh, some Hindu ideas. And he was very distant from Christianity. But near the end of his life, which was rather short, he was, I think he was only 47 or 48 when he died, a priest came to see him, uh, quite uninvited by him. He was on his deathbed, and the priest sat down and he said, why are you, he Thoreau said, why are you here? And the priest said, I'm here to make, help you make peace with God. And Thoreau said, I'm not aware that we ever quarreled. And <laughs> and then he said, well, I'm here to prepare you for the next life. And then Thoreau said, one life at a time. Um, <laughs> so I think he was onto something that, you know, when you introduce this other, the X, another X factor, which is inexplicable, but mul with multiple compl uh, complexities, it doesn't really help the situation. You have spiritual work to do, and you'll know when, when it's succeeding, because you'll feel it. <clears throat> now, the apophatic, now this means, by the way, you should define that for your audience. I don't know, everybody's gonna scramble for the dictionary, but it means basically that you, it's things you can't, that you can't express. And it's, there is a tradition where, in mystical Christianity and other mystical traditions, that they get, 
insights and awarenesses and understandings that is just it's useless to try and express in in words and uh so this is what some the, uh, uh, theistic conditions have come to, like Master Eckhart, um, who his idea is emptiness, the the core emptiness, and so he sounds like he's maybe coming close. So you see, perhaps in my dialogue with with the rabbi, um, he also talks about this um, this idea of emptiness, and. Uh, God is in every is is everything is not not a being but being itself and so forth. So it starts to become inexpressible, but maybe we're overlapping. It's very hard to tell. Uh, language is one thing, but experience is another. But we have the same issue when we when we try to speak about nibbana. Nibbana, while experienced while alive, is certainly expressible, and it's uh, expressible in words like joy and ease and freedom from suffering, etc. So, but what Pari Nibbana is, is where the, the problem of express, uh, the possibilities of expression come from. And the, the Buddha himself did as, did as best as any human can do. And I, it's very interesting how many people want to clarify what the Buddha meant. <laughs> about Parinibbana. So I think, well, you know, as if the Buddha couldn't express it well. Say, well, you know, he was, he's fumbling around for words here. The Buddha is fumbling around for words, but this is what he meant. You know? <laughs> I think that it's better to just leave it as uh, whatever is actually explicitly expressed in the suttas about Parinibbana and this thing, this Nibbana thing, Whatever is explicitly expressed is all that one could say. <clears throat> and if it, if it feels inadequate, then it, it's really the inadequacy of words and expression. It's not the inadequacy of the Buddha himself. It's the limits of expression. And we just have to accept it. Others would like to F the ineffable. They would like to say the unsayable, uh, and but if if it could have been said, the Buddha would have said it. <clears throat> so you have to be content with that. <laughs> yeah, that's a great expression, uh, by the way. Um, <laughs> but but it's impressive, actually. The the book, the island. Have you the by Ajahn Lumpur Pasano and Ajahn Amaro? I mean, it's yes. Uh, yes, and those are attempts, again, you know, you find this in the forest tradition, in the Thai forest tradition particularly, and it, there is a, some, something of a tension between that and maybe the uh, mainstream Sri Lankan tradition but, uh, about this, the nature of Parinibbana and what is meant by Nibbana and Parinibbana. And you will see attempts to resolve this. I think after a while, every monk tries to pin it down a little more, get some definition on it. But I have to say that I, I think it's a hopeless task. A lot of good minds over the... This is the uh, something like the, the reconciliation of, of uh, physics at the, at the quantum scale with, with that at the major... At the, the the lar the macro scale, the unified field theory is just like the, it's impossible to express. It never has been able to be expressed, and they they can't put it together. <clears throat> but everybody keeps trying. So, you know, I I've heard both sides um, of this, and you have camps on both sides, and uh, you have people attempting to define uh, the. Anidasa, Vijnana, etc. The uh, the signless consciousness as it means this, it means that, and so on. <laughs> uh, and you have Abhidhamma attempts to explain. You know, they have uh, Hari Nibbana as an element, at whatever that means. So these things, I've, I'm 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 happy after 
given it a shot myself a few times, I'm happy to step back and say, I, you just have, I don't, I wouldn't, I don't think a commentary needs to explain it. If the Buddha couldn't pull this one off, the central idea of his entire teaching, if he couldn't quite get it out, couldn't spit it out, then who can? <laughs> Why would you need the Abhidhamma or the commentaries to do this? Uh, I think you just have to be content with what is expressed there in the in the uh, suttas. And the rest is personal experience. Uh, that's the only the only thing that can happen because it's it's very different than ordinary experience. And the words that we have in, in vocabularies are developed by people having ordinary experiences. They talk about how much things cost and how much things weigh and how far it is to the next city. And that's the ordinary experience. And I feel bad, I feel happy today and so forth. But this type of of special consciousness that one is cultivating, the development of the of enlightenment is there aren't words for that because most people never experience it. And, and there's lots of these mystical traditions where there is no attempt to express it. It's just inexpressible. The Buddha has gone as far as anybody possibly could, and he's very meticulous and ingenious at expressing the contents of the enlightened mind as far as it can go. But I think some people keep trying to push it farther than it can be pushed. You know? uh, John, what do you think about um, people who will define Nibbana like in a more mundane way? So like a traditional uh, way of thinking about conceiving of Nibbana is this real cutting off of greed, anger, and delusion in a way which there's no backsliding for. But there are a number of places in the canon, like say, I think it's Dhammapada 131 or something like that, this quote about uh, the cracked gong. So if someone like a cracked gong will not respond when someone has you know, censured them or something like this, then that is a form of Nibbana or this Upasamanu Sati, this recollection of peace, which is mis mentioned along with um, you know, five other recollections in a somewhat mundane way. And this question is kind of leading in the direction of certain other Buddhist schools like uh, Tibetan Dzogchen, who will talk about mm -hmm. You know, taking the goal as the path, and I'm curious if you feel like there's a um, if there's a path for that within traditional Theravada Buddhism is conceiving of a way of turning the mind as being like a a temporary or a uh, instrumental nibbana to get one to an ultimate nibbana. Well, I mean, even uh, the Buddha talks about. Uh, jhana as uh, temporary nibbana. Yeah. He's samadhi. Yeah, that's right. Sama samadhi is temporary nibbana. Temp so nibbana is the cooling, the cooling off of the uh, the, the passions, the, the, the greed, hatred, and delusions. The cooling is the the chilling of that and so forth. And uh, so you get temporary experiences of this where the hindrances have disappeared. The But the, of course, the uh, Samyojanas, the roots, the fetters have not disappeared. They're there in latent form. But you're getting, I, so I think that uh, uh, an unenlightened person who has samadhi crosses over and experiences uh, the enlightenment factors. Uh, and, and, and certainly in the first two stages of enlightenment, the person crosses back into the hindrances. It's very clear that the the Sotapanna and the uh, so, Saka Dagami still have uh, possibilities of the hindrances arising, of greed and anger arising. They have a certain level of the, the part of the their the root delusion has been atrophied, reduced, but is not gone, and but they they access greed and anger under certain conditions. And the ordinary person who has samadhi accesses the delightful conditions of joy, ease and serenity that the are factors, the seven factors of enlightenment. So the I would say that an ordinary person can get a taste of of what of enlightenment. 
However, because the the roots of the problem have not been attenuated, it, it, it will always return until they, they uh, break th through. And it, it will continue to return even in the first two stages of enlightenment. It's only in the third stage of enlightenment that the, the, the fetters, the greed and hatred are terminated and don't arise even under provocation. There's still something left to go there. There's still a mild tendency of the mind to move and so forth. But so that these things cross over and one can experience it and one can go back and forth. And it's a good thing that they do. Because, and the Buddha is encouraging, you know, try this. And if you get there, that's, you've got the taste. This is the taste. The samadhi is the taste of enlightenment. The hindrances, your troubles are gone for a while. Um, now, if you can understand how that works and the roots of these things, what we're looking for is that they never return. So um, it's only in the stage of final stage at the Arahant stage where it is the, the roots of it are completely removed that it, it can't, it, it's not that they don't do these things. They don't, that it's not that mindfulness is keeping them in check or something like this. It's not that they don't, it's that they can't, they literally can't uh, generate these, uh, the, the fetters, the primary 10 fetters, they can't generate it, they can't generate the hindrances. It's not available. So even under circumstances of, of illness, you know, uh, a bladder infection or something that makes some people a little loopy and everything, uh, the, the possibility of having delusions or anger or greed are intrinsically removed. It's almost like a part of your brain has been cut out, you know. Yeah, that that's interesting. And I, I if I had ever seen that uh, reference to jhana being like a, a temporary nibbana, nibbana. Yeah. that's fascinating. I, I'm curious. Well, you that, know that th please. this word nibbana is we're used widely, and and I say you know even like a good some a nice cool drink on a hot day is called nibbana. You know, it's ice cream is nibbana. It's just which nibbana you're talking about. So these are quenchings um, of delightful ease and, and coolness and so forth. And they all, they hint at something that is possible on a deeper level and a more continuous level. And so that's why the Buddha has this idea of Micha samadhi. So there is wrong samadhi, but it has the characteristics of samadhi. But it's it's based on worldly ideas. It's not a not a terrible thing. It's not an immoral thing. It's just that it's the object of the that caused the samadhi. Which so he's giving credit for say listening to music with great delight and absorption. He's crediting that as samadhi, and a type of nibbana really. And except that it's the wrong one. <laughs> so, but you got the idea. Uh, would you like more of that? And would you like to sustain that? So you, he's saying, look, it's not something that is impossible to experience, except, you know, nothing in life corresponds to this. And then one day this happens and it's like nothing you ever experienced before. No, it's like something you've experienced before, but you can't maintain it. You don't know how it happened. Ajahn, you uh, listening to your talks on, on jhana and on right effort, um, mm -hmm. you talk about um, bringing jhana into existence and some of the preconditions which you mention are yeah. faith. So faith yes. being a precondition for jhana, but also you talk about, quote, smiling it into existence. So basically like, yeah, having this upwelling <clears throat> yeah. of, of well-being, being able to bring yeah. about jhana. I'm curious if you could talk about those two aspects of, of yeah. bringing about jhana. You're, you're allowed to induce it. So whatever the tricks are that, that help you induce it. I think so. Think of the, the Buddha on after he quit the extreme ascetic, ascetic life. Part of the reason why he why, came back to his experience of jhana was that he had he was out of the sun. And he was near a this was a cool breeze, and he he decided to eat, and he had he had also decided not to torture his body ever again. So this is an induction that brought him 
to and, and then he he feels this relief which reminds him of his childhood when he was truly at peace and happy with his uh his stepmother or his aunt rather and uh at a at a plowing festival and it was beautiful conditions so that's an induction he remembered being a child and he the reason why was because the conditions were so conducive to just ease and and also this stopping this terrible infliction of pain so that's an induction as well so he, before he's inducing this he's thinking pain is a good thing uh starving is a good thing uh never bathing is a good thing you know uh so that's an induction and so he stopped that he says i don't think it is a good thing so then he thinks well what is a good thing you know well i remember when i was a kid i was at peace i was it was just blissfully at peace so he he's remembering he's using memories as a an induction device <clears throat> so this is also what you can do to induce samadhi samadhi uh so the, the word faith means that you trust and that's what uh, a child who is has experienced uh good caring has is they have faith in their mother they have they trust their parents they have absolute deep faith that's when the parent picked them up they don't think god i hope they don't drop me they just they they just lie they just sleep in their arms right because they have faith and that's the that's the faith that, that the buddha is talking about he's talking about uh if you can just trust this and not be always nervous about something this may not be for me this can't i can't do it you can't do it and it's, it might be the wrong thing it what it, that that's going to totally interrupt it, your uh, possibilities. So you, you're looking to trust, and it, lots of people have um, had their trust violated quite early in life, and they don't really. And some of the people don't know what trust is, and so that's what uh, early experience of love is uh, is uh, trust. And that the person who has an early experience of love will be uh, emotionally much better balanced than a person who has been uh, not experienced that. And they will be much more able and closer to the possibility of samadhi as well. <clears throat> they can they can let go and and go into this state. Uh, and that's what a lot of people express be samadhi they, they they're afraid to go there it's the unknown they're afraid but if you have faith then you can you easily go in on a faith basis uh you you have a trust basis and trust is very similar to is, is one of the main ingredients in in love you know in uh sort of uh meta kind of love or brotherly love that as well Yeah, uh, John, I'm, I'm curious if you could say any more about as as one cultivates this love relationship with with jhana or with one's meditation object, um, especially say if one is like entering into that uh, from a basis of loving kindness or from metta or, or from compassion. I mean, the way that compassion is conceived of in a Western context in the world is one of constantly going out. But one of the factors for jhana or for deep concentration is seclusion and i'm curious if you would be able to to speak to that it seems like there's a some people might think there's a like inherent contradiction in that how can you be completely secluded if your object is compassion for other people um, yeah the the buddha himself is reported to that you know his, sort of his day is uh reported and uh, at night between 10 and 2 a.m. is the time when he's hanging out with the devas. The devas are coming to visit him. The Jetavana Grove is lit up. Uh, and then apparently he sleeps for about two hours between uh, 2 a.m. and, say, 4 a.m. And then he gets up and he does Maha Karuna. 
meaning great compassion, samadhi. And that's the, and he kind of, he, he enters that. And of course it's before dawn. He's, he can't go on alms round, but you re, you see that he, he goes into this condition of great compassion and then uh, specifically sort of scans the world for individuals who might benefit from his teachings or his presence somehow. And then he, pers he goes and in the act of, of going through the village on alms round, he sometimes encounters these people he has in mind. And then the expression of his uh, karuna uh, manifests. So, but if you don't, if you don't really have this deep, compassionate sense, the ideas of how to actually benefit others won't come to you. So Karuna is a creative as well. And this is something that you don't have to, you can't s go through it systematically. You can't logically produce the ways that will benefit people quite often. You have to trust that the stillness and, and beauty of compassion is compassion is, is just loving kindness for those who are suffering or potentially suffering. They may not be explicitly suffering, but they, they will suffer if they don't have certain information. So this abiding in that is uh, triggers creativity and the kind of creativity that cannot be accessed through linear processes. Now, here we come to this, I'm, I'm quite immersed in this uh, hemisphere, you know, brain hemispheres. And the left hemisphere is, is more of a technical systematic thing and examining how composers or poets come up with their art, that it's, it's not through linear processes. And even scientific discoveries are not through linear processes. They're by another part of the mind that can't, that doesn't function that way. It's working on things, putting things together, and it comes out all at one shot. But only if you can trust that silence, if you can even distract yourself in some way and not be preoccupied by thinking things through, do these uh, great ideas arise. And so this is something that a trust part of the mind as well, the, the, the right hemisphere, is, is able to produce something a creative act of loving kindness towards those who, whose suffering can be alleviated by that. So Ajahn, that's um, a really helpful and a good segue into the book you've referenced by Ian McGilchrist, McGilchrist, I think? Yes. So, um, the Matter with Things, and specifically his work on the two hemispheres. So I'm curious, apart from this, um, association of the right hemisphere with loving kindness and maybe spontaneous creativity at the least. Um, what other points of resonance and salient takeaways, you know, have interested you from this book? You know, what, are there any Buddhist overlays that you see between the two hemispheres? Um, or what, you know, where, what's been interesting you about this? Why is it relevant? Yeah, well, the first time I really started, I mean, I, when I was in university in, let's say, 1972 and taking psychology, uh, we, we were talking about hemispheres then, and psychology was talking about the hemispheres, because this has been around a long time, because strokes and, in fact, uh, what I call hemispherectomies, uh, you can actually remove half of the brain, and a person can still function. But if you remove, depends on which half you remove, uh, the personality changes and the, the perspective and, and language and all these things are, they were no, this was noticed um, a long time ago. Uh, brain damage and so forth on one hemisphere uh, changes all kinds of affects. And uh, so it was still, it, it became a kind of a popular lingo, you know, uh, you're, you're, your left hemisphere type, your right hemisphere type. So, but it's moved a long ways since then. And then 
a little later in the 70s, a book came out by a psychologist at Yale, I think it was. His name was Julian Jaynes. And it was called The Arising of Consciousness in the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. And he, he, this is something that happened to him. He was having a nap on the, uh, in the middle of the day on a couch. And he, he heard a voice talk to him. And he, he kind of woke up out of that. And he realized there was nobody there. And it was, it must have been his own voice, but it, it was non-volitional. And he started to think about this and he, th he think he began to think you know all of those the the odyssey and 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 so forth there are voices talking to these people and were the hemispheres less you know more separated and that you experience the your own inner voice as as a the voice of another like an external voice <clears throat> And did at some point they start to blend and you became self-conscious that you, you felt that it was your voice, your own inner voice talking to you. So this was the beginning of a, a very interesting period of time. And it kind of, it was very influential for a while and then it kind of faded out. So then others, of course, explore this, but it, it kind of has been in the background. And then McGilchrist, who's both, his original education is is in uh, the arts, as uh, in English, and he was very interested in poetry, particularly. And then he went on to become a psychiatrist. So he has an incredible command of language, very beautiful use of language, and so forth. But as a psychiatrist, he is studying schizophrenia and other effects, and and also brain, uh, you know, strokes and brain injuries. And he's just amassing a huge amount of information about the nature of each of the hemispheres and how they interplay and what they do. And he, what he's what the important part of this is that the the peculiar nature of modernity, and that is that we are very machine dominated. We're very technically dominated. We're very scientifically dominated. We're very reductionist we're taking everything apart into little pieces and it's saying that's what reality is it's little pieces and he's saying that is very characteristic of the left hemisphere and that the whole educational structures introduced in very early childhood are over activating and putting the left hemisphere in priority over the right and the right hemisphere is where poetry is generated as the larger meanings of life, religious experience, mystical experience, art is experienced. <clears throat> Without the right hemisphere, none of that is experienced. And the, 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 every, the world and everything in it becomes more or less something to use rather than something to admire or ex see as beautiful and this creates all kinds of problems for society and for the individual and all kinds of secondary uh, structures and you see this uh, exaggerated in schizophrenia and so forth as well uh, and and uh, strokes where stroke when when there's strokes in the right hemisphere the left hemisphere is all that's left and you will see this excessive uh, technological, reductive, uh, linear kind of experience of the world, but it's only a partial experience of the world. So he is saying this, there's some that the left hemisphere has somewhat taken over is running the show. Now, his first book was called the, the master and his emissary. And this is a, a little story by Nietzsche that uh, this master, this, this ruler of a country sends off a minister to uh, direct us a, a county. Uh, the, the, the minister, though, starts to take himself too seriously and starts to take over. He wants to take over the whole 
country. He, the emissary begins to want to take over the, the country and run it according to the accounting principles, <laughs> etc. kind of linear, lower principles. And so he, he, that, that was his first book, which is, you know, it's 650 pages long, all on the, the functions of hemisphere. Well, but that wasn't, and I read that in some years back. It came out maybe six or seven years ago. But in the meantime, he's, he's been working on a larger opus, which is, uh, it's, got, it's got to be 1,500 pages long. And it's, it's this a, a more in-depth exploration of this. And I think it's a revelation. And, I th and a lot of people who have read it, including the Archbishop of Canterbury <laughs> and uh, other, other people as well, who are deep thinkers, have found it to be a revelation. And this is what meditators discover is this this brings us out of the conventions uh conventional thinking of modernity and many of us were we were, were brought into the educational system we probably do quite well in the educational system we analyze we we uh, synthesize we take things apart and everything we we use that part of our brain quite and we're used to it but there's something missing which is why we probably tried meditation <laughs> And when you meditate for a while, things change and you start to see things differently and feel things differently and approach the world and other people differently. <clears throat> and that's the, the re restor return and restoration of the, the preeminence of the right hemisphere, creativity, loving kindness, poetry, sensitivity, appreciation of nature, uh, etc. At the big picture of life and the universe, etc. This is the the function of which has been lost somewhere in the West, starting probably in the 16th century. And you can see it in religious orders in uh, the Catholic religious contemplative orders. They began to be question the 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 relevance and importance of contemplation, and they were more or less told to be useful make yourself what do you what's all this praying about what it's not useful you got to get useful so they start like all kinds of work projects and science projects uh you know mendel was uh the the, the roots of biology and the the genetic theory is is an augustinian monk um uh, and that that whole monastery was on scientific projects and so forth this is like and when you do this, you lose, you lose the ability to, to uh, enjoy silence and, and stillness and being, etc. So this is a very, this is important explanation for, the, so I think we, the monks, uh, we understand what he's talking about. We don't necessarily need him. The world needs him because he is, um, He's legitimizing this with a lot of footnotes and a lot of science and so forth. He's, and uh, but we can use that. We can we can um, benefit from that because we can use references like this that the world around us understands. <clears throat> we can use technical talk and so forth to persuade them that there is another dimension of life, and it's it's not just mysticism and airy fairy this and that. There's something very much to this yeah so that's the value of that particular book now it's it's a substantial tome and not everybody is up to reading that kind of stuff but uh i find it helps with some of my explanations as well yeah, yeah it seems like uh, there's a lot of research on the brain coming out and specifically research on the brain and meditation but it, it seems that there's a dearth of studies on really well-practiced, you know, people who've got, you know, 30,000, 40, you know, 40,000 hours of meditation under their belt. So like real experts right. in, in jhana. And I'm curious if you would be willing to speculate, having read some of this literature, having read the Ian McGilchrist book about what might be going on in the brain of someone who attains jhana perhaps, or would it depend on the, the object of jhana if one's doing, you know, a suba, you know, meditating on a corpse versus meditating on loving kindness or, or 
do you think that there might be something, some unifying aspect which is um, present in some brain manifestation of any form of, uh, or any topic of meditation? Um, yeah. Similarities. Yeah. Notice that <laughs> when the Buddha introduced a Subha meditation and then went on retreat for a period of a few months, uh, when he came out, 30 monks were missing. <laughs> they had committed suicide. <laughs> so a Subha, by the way, to our audience is, is reflection on the unbeautiful nature of the body, the, the, the absence of beauty, the kind of the, the gushy, the mucky, gooey side of the body, the, the parts when we look inside that are repulsive or sim are certainly not beautiful. Um, he, he gave this out, but apparently the monks did not handle it well. They really got overdosed on their left hemisphere there. And uh, it, it was a downer for them to the degree that they really wanted to get rid of that body. Now, when they came out, what did he, what did he give them as an antidote to that? Now, this is where you see this story is, by the way, in the Vinaya. And he, he introduces breath meditation to them. And so that to, in order to do science, by the way, it's not that science is, is a, is the bad thing. Science can be done without hurting yourself. So science is kind of reductionism. It's, it's a dividing everything into parts and, and it's also looking into the body, all of the aspects of the body and the universe down to little atoms and so forth. You can hurt yourself with that. If you don't have a proper sustaining of the, of the health your mental health and your emotional health. And so that's what the, the introduction of that uh, compensating side, the breath meditation, which is non-discursive. And by the way, that's the characteristic of the right hemisphere. The left hemisphere is language oriented and the left hemisphere is, and, and reductionist, the right hemisphere is, is holistic and, and uh, not, not in language involved. <clears throat> And so he's, he's seeing this, he's balancing this so that you um, can manage the necessary craft of using the world, which is, it's necessary to use the world for livelihoods and, and various reasons, but without being swallowed up in it and, and producing despair. So we are asked to go and contemplate corpses even. I, and I've done this. I mean, in Thailand, we had a, I was at a monastery where we had four or five corpses come through. You spend days or weeks kind of contemplating a, a decomposing corpse. But I, I didn't feel horrified, terrified, nauseated, or any of these things. I felt, I felt joy. I felt love. I felt compassion. Uh, I felt awe at the, the the reality of what life really ends up being. All of these things, because that's the that's the proper use of this. It's not to horrify yourself. It's to understand. So these things have to be properly balanced, and uh, that the meditations. Are, and so, so he gives out a, a group of meditations to new monks, and, and it's for everybody as well. And one of them is loving kindness, another one is breath meditation, and another one is uh, contemplating impermanence, but asuba meditation as well, especially for monks. But the, you notice it's balanced with some redeeming aspects, loving kindness in the midst of, of, the, of your vision of your own body and the body of others becoming disenchanted, like being coming disenchanted with, with reality and seeing at things as they are. At the same time, you're able to maintain a warm and hopeful heart and a, 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 a mind that's not cluttered or scattered because of the breath meditation. So breath meditation is uh, primarily for the absence of discomfort excessive discursive activity, excessive language. So excessive thinking, analyzing, etc., is cut off by breath meditation. It's a necessary health balance for these things. <laughs>